You may be familiar with the violent physical changes and destructive forces that seem to have affected widespread animal populations at the end of the Pleistocene Epoch. Most often those discussed are the finds in Alaska and Siberia. But the evidence from South America is as strong if not stronger and reveals a rapid rising of the land out of the ocean. Let's dive in and find out more. In the heart of the Andes, at an average elevation of 12,300 feet, it extends the highest lake basin in the world, the Altiplano, on the floor of which occur a succession of remarkable lakes. The largest of the lakes is Lake Titicaca. It is 110 miles long and 35 miles wide, and nearly 890 feet deep at its maximum. Its waters are only slightly brackish and support the only species of seahorse the hippocampus. These creatures are usually marine creatures, and together with a few other oceanic life forms which inhabit the lake, it strongly suggests that the present fauna of Lake Titicaca has survived from a time when the lake was in contact with the ocean. Lake Popo is about 180 miles south of Lake Titicaca, and about 12,000 feet above sea level. It receives its water from Lake Titicaca via a sluggish river. The lake is about 50 miles long and 20 miles across, with a maximum depth of only 9 feet. Its waters are so salty that fish reaching it from Lake Titicaca cannot survive in it. The waters from Lake Popo seep seasonally southwards through a river that eventually reach the very briny Lake Coipasa, again around 1200 feet above sea level. This lake has no outlets. Its size is indeterminate as the southern portion forms a salt desert some 50 miles by 35 miles in area. Still further south is an immense salt plain, also at about 1200 feet. Stretching to the southwest is a long chain of small marshes, salt, saltpeter and borax lakes lying on the floor of a winding valley nearly 100 miles in length but only 8 to 10 miles wide. These strange salty lakes continue over the border into Bolivia and northwest Argentina, reaching as far as the southern extremity of the Atacama province. An analysis of the water in Lake Titicaca and Lake Popo reveal that they have a chemical composition similar to those of the ocean. Moreover, Lake Titicaca is full of a characteristic salt mollusk, which shows that it is, geologically speaking, of relatively modern origin. Another strange feature is the strand line left by this ancient sea on the slopes of the mountain enclosing the Altiplano. A few miles south of Lake Titicaca lies the ruined site of Tiwanaku. Although the ruins are now over 13 miles from Lake Titicaca, there are reasons to think that in the days when the city was occupied, it stood on the shores of the lake itself. There is evidence that what is considered a dry moat is in fact canals leading up to a peculiar rectangular depression which may have been docks or harbour basin. Evidence to support this comes from the fact that alkaline incrustations on the side of the huge stone blocks forming parts of these structures. The line of these incrustations corresponds closely with that of the strand line on the slopes of the surrounding mountain. This strand line as observed today is not level. It slopes further to the south and seems to be a progressive change. At one end, this change is only one foot per mile, but increases to more than two feet per mile. This strand line is very distinctive. It consists not only of notches cut into the rock by the prolonged action of shore waves and fan-like delta deposits of mud and gravel which formed when streams dropped these on meeting the ancient water's edge, but also a white lime of a thickness of many feet upon the red sandstone, slate, grey granite or andesite. This is the residue of a certain calcareous algae. The general explanation for this slanting strand line is due to an imbalanced rise of South America out of the waters of the ocean. On the basis of geological evidence, it is believed that in geologically recent times, the whole Cordillera was violently upheaved and the Inter-Andean Sea thereby caused to vanish the remnants of which have over long periods of time sunk to their present state. A remarkable confirmation of this can be found in the ancient agricultural stone terraces surrounding the Titicaca Basin. These structures belong to some bygone civilization. They occur at altitudes far too high to support the growth of crops 
for which they were originally built. Some rise to 15,000 feet above sea level, or about 2,500 feet above Tiwanaku. On Mount Ilimani, they occur up to 18,400 feet, and this is above the line of eternal snow. There are many other ruins found throughout Peru and Bolivia that seem to be located in the middle of a desert. Is it possible that in the past these locations were much lower and closer to the shoreline and were much more hospitable? This of course presents a rather large problem, as these changes are supposed to have happened at least 10 to 15 million years ago. So either this civilization is much older than is accepted, or these events took place in a time frame that is much shorter. There have been discoveries of vast quantities of animal remains in almost every part of South America. Historically, bones of large Pleistocene mammals were noticed in South America soon after the Spanish conquest. Curious theories were then advanced by these early discoverers that usually refer to an ancient race of giants who were supposed to have inhabited various parts of the New World. Around the dawn of the 19th century, bones of elephants and mastodons were discovered in Venezuela and Colombia. These were especially abundant in an area known as the Field of the Giants. Cuvier also discovered remains at a much higher altitude, on the slopes of the volcano of Ibambura at an elevation of 7,200 feet. In 1827, Professor Charles Lyell was shown a block of limestone from Brazil, which had been obtained by Captain Elliot of the US Navy. The block contained a human skull, teeth and other bones, together with fragments of shells, some of which still retain traces of their original colour. Remains of several hundreds of human skeletons were dug out of similar calcareous rock at the same place. The presence of oyster shells in the rock suggests that all the remains were deposited through marine action. Portions of the bone were discovered with a stalactitic deposit of carbonate of lime, looking very much like mummified skin. The rock in which the skeleton was embedded consisted of fragments of shells united by a stalactitic matter, and contained nodules of carbonaceous matter. In a limestone cavern on the borders of the Lago do Somiduro, the remains of more than 30 individuals of various ages were excavated. The skeletons were buried in hard clay, overlaying the original red soil, forming the floor of the cave, and were found mixed together in such great confusion with not only themselves but also the remains of the Megatherium and other Pleistocene mammals. This rules out the idea that they had been entombed by other humans. These finds were found in many other caves across Brazil. One of the more peculiar finds was of the remains of mastodons, camels and an extinct species of horse in the beds of volcanic ash high in the Andes in Ecuador. Associated with these mammalian bones was the fossilized skull of a woman of Australoid type the presence of an Australoid type in Ecuadorian South America during geologically recent times poses questions about prehistoric populations. The critical point about these findings is in their stark demonstration that in South America humans and animals of the late Pleistocene were exposed to and perished by some geological upheaval of inconceivable violence and extent. The abundance of the Pleistocene animal fossils in South America compares very well with those of Siberia and North America. Incredibly, many of the authorities agree that the freshness of a high proportion of the skeletal remains and the associated substances found is all the more remarkable for a continent that is mostly within the tropical zone. Darwin observed in the Voyage of the Beagle that some remains of large unknown mammals exhumed from Pleistocene deposits in the Benda Oriental district in Uruguay, appeared so fresh that it was difficult to believe that they have lain buried for ages underground. The bone contained so much animal matter that when heated in the flame of a spirit lamp, it not only exhaled a very strong animal odour, but likewise burned with a slight flame. Fossil bones, when subjected to heat or fire, do not ordinarily burn with a flame. Richard Owen noted a similar perfect state of preservation as regards the individual bones and concluded that it must have been buried almost immediately upon death. In the Pampas area, mammalian skeletons were discovered in natural or upright positions 
and these are embedded in undisturbed or largely stratified beds of gravel, mud or loam. Giant armadillo shells were discovered standing upright on their edges, and there are many instances of large incomplete mammalian skeletons found upside down or their bones found scattered randomly within a small space. These extraordinary modes of burial are found across widely separate regions in South America, showing different animal types are mixed with human bones. Associated with this over a truly widespread region are the fossilised land and sea creatures mingled in no order and yet entombed in the same geological horizon. Then there are mastodon remains found at altitude impossibly high for their normal existence. So here we have evidence of a great upheaval of the land, coupled with cataclysmic events that caused the death of thousands, if not millions of mammals, entombed so rapidly so as to preserve their bones and remains in an extraordinary way, coupled with evidence of vast walls of water sweeping across the land. Any theory must therefore be able to account for all of these changes. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.